from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Coming up today on Ag Day, a teen, a steer, and a question. See what this was all about. Should lakes have rights like people? The issue going before voters today. And more signs of a thaw and trade tensions between the U.S. and China moving markets. We're going to have a signing summit, which is even better. Ag Day, presented by the all-new Chevy Silverado, the strongest, most advanced Silverado ever. Good morning, I'm Betsy Gibbon. Clinton is on assignment. President Trump's decision to extend a deadline to escalate tariffs on Chinese imports is creating cautious optimism in global markets. President Trump announcing over the weekend he would extend the deadline, citing substantial progress and talks between the two countries, tweeting Sunday that there had been productive talks, adding that, quote, I will be delaying the U.S. increase in tariffs now scheduled for March 1st. The president saying that if negotiations continue to progress, he will meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping at his Florida resort to finalize an agreement. But I told you how uh, how well we did with our trade talks in China, and it looks like uh, they'll be coming back quickly again, and we're going to have a, uh, another summit. We're going to have a signing summit, which is even better. So hopefully we can get that completed, but we're getting very, very close. Ambassador Lighthizer, Steve Mnuchin, uh, a lot of folks in the room have been helping, and uh, that's been great. And during talks that extended into the weekend, our Washington sources say U.S. and Chinese negotiators discussed the issue of how to enforce a potential deal. The two sides also discussed Chinese commitments to purchase commodities. Officials aim to iron out differences on changes to China's treatment of state-owned enterprises, subsidies, forced technology transfers, and cyber theft. The Shanghai Composite Index jumped 5.5 percent on Monday. U.S. stocks also rising on the news about a delay in the tariff increase. Jake Parker is the vice president of the U.S.-China Business Council. He called the president's announcement a positive signal that a resolution may soon be in sight. State-owned enterprise reform, industrial policy changes are not items that can be changed overnight or would be reasonable to expect to be resolved in 90 days. So by finding a way where the two sides can come to some kind of agreement and then put these more challenging issues into a longer term negotiating framework should have a very positive impact on the overall relationship. Parker says the uncertainty over trade tensions has meant many business operations of U.S. companies in China have ground to a halt and an agreement would help their situation. Farmers also interested in seeing a resolution. We're trying to make decisions about you know, planting acres and so forth. And so as, as we look into the coming year, that, that segment of a market that we've worked so hard to build is, you know, it's, it's in question right now. So I hope we can get something solved and normalize trade relations with China because they definitely are a big customer of ours. Ag has been a big part of discussions with China. On Friday, Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue reported China had agreed to purchase another 10 million metric tons of U.S. soybeans. A new number showed China's buys of U.S. soybeans last month nearly doubled from December. Reuters reports data published by Chinese customs officials shows China bought 135,000 metric tons of soybeans last month. That's up 95% from the 69,000 metric tons in December. But that number is still now, but that number is still down 99% from the 5.8 million metric tons it purchased a year earlier. While trade talks between the U.S. and China have been getting all the attention, two top U.S. ag trade officials say once progress is made on that front, the next focus is expected to be Japan. U.S. Trade Representative's Office Chief Ag Negotiator Greg Dowd and Undersecretary for Trade and Foreign Agricultural Affairs Ted McKenney spoke about it during last week's Agricultural Outlook Forum. They say the urgency to reach a bilateral deal with Japan stems from similar agreements made by Japan in recent months with competitor countries. Those deals could impact Japanese-bound U.S. ag exports, especially U.S. beef. We still have a 38.5% duty on U.S. beef going into Japan, while, as you've just pointed out, our major competitors through CPTPP or TPP-11 without the U.S., are now benefiting from reduced tariffs. 
Undersecretary McKenney says U.S. Japanese relations remain strong. He acknowledges that after a while, prices can wear away. That's why he says there's urgency to get to Japan so we can maintain a market presence. And more U.S. ag product is on its way overseas. USDA reports a sale of 279,000 metric tons of corn for delivery to Mexico. Of that, 88,000 is for delivery this year. Another 190,000 is for delivery later this year or next. USDA will hold its first public listening session for the new farm bill this morning. The session is for initial input on the farm bill. The department wants comments on programs implemented by the Farm Service Agency, Natural Resources Conservation Service, and the Risk Management Agency. We're still in the early stages, but it will be a process that will that'll be taking place uh, throughout the year. And uh, like I said, we're hoping to get things finalized by later this year. This is the first of what could be many sessions. Additional written comments will be accepted through Friday. African swine fever is spreading to more provinces of Vietnam. According to Reuters, ASF has been discovered in two more provinces. This was after the disease first showed up at farms in two additional provinces in the country earlier in February. African swine fever has been rapidly spreading throughout China and hog herds since August. American producers remain on high alert since there is not a vaccine developed yet to stop the disease. From what we hear, it's um, the Folks at USDA at Plum Island that have been working on it told me they think a decade away. We've heard from the EU that it might be 20 years. Wagstrom says there is a foot and mouth disease vaccine developed, which is in the farm bill. However, it won't protect against ASF because it's a different disease. Toledo, Ohio residents will vote in a special election today. It's about whether to give Lake Erie its own Bill of Rights. The proposal states the lake could be given rights as an ecosystem that citizens would be legally entitled to defend. Supporters hope it will prevent further pollution by potentially granting legal rights to ecosystems. Those against it, such as the Ohio Farm Bureau, say the measure could cause a domino effect of unnecessary lawsuits in agriculture. The state's Farm Bureau claims the measure would give Lake Erie legal standing in court and allow any Toledo citizen to represent the lake and file lawsuits on its behalf. So many people still digging out and cleaning up from big winter storms this past weekend. Meteorologist Cindy Clausen has more in today's crop comments. Well, Betsy, it was certainly a rough weekend in parts of the country, but it also created some amazing scenes like this one shared on Twitter by Ron Miles Jr. Ron lives in Clear Lake, Iowa. He's a freelance photographer who clearly has an eye. Just look at this amazing shot showing blowing snow as the sun set over Clear Lake. You'll also notice the two bright, colorful splotches on either side of the picture. Those are called sun dogs, and that happens when ice crystals in the atmosphere refract the sunlight. Very cool picture. Thanks for sharing that with us. Let's take a look at the wind forecast as we head through the day today. It's going to be pretty windy right up in New England, also in parts of the Intermountain West, especially over to Wyoming on over into California. And as we head through the day today, those will be the two areas to really watch. So the winds really start to spread through the Intermountain West. We're going to be seeing some unsettled weather there. As we head into the overnight hours, things start to slacken off a little bit in the Northeast as that system continues to pull away. But as we head through the day on Wednesday, watch how the winds really start to uh, pick up more in the western part of the country. I'll have your national forecast coming up. But for now, here are some hometown temps. Introducing Farm Journal TV on demand 24 7 Ag Day Machinery Pete TV U.S. Farm Report on your phone and tablet. Download the Farm Journal TV mobile app today. As winter rolls on, several places in the country are on pace to break some records for snow. Over the weekend, the cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis were forced to declare snow emergencies, and more snow is expected on the way tonight. This month, now the sixth snowiest month of any month on record for the Twin Cities. All of that snow has to go somewhere, which means forecasters are preparing for spring. We've got a tremendous amount of lowland flooding, ponding water, stretching all the way from the northern Mississippi Delta into the Ohio Valley with another couple of storms lined up and the p potential for spring storminess. 
I do think that's an area to target for spring fieldwork delays and potential flo uh, major flooding, river flooding, as we head into the spring months. Other areas of concern, Arkansas extending northeastward into states like Missouri, Indiana, and Illinois all have extremely wet soil. On the flip side, Rippy says some areas of the Midwest had bitter cold and little snowfall, and that could help kill pests. Would a trade deal with China finally get the markets moving? We have some analysis coming up. And later, how one teen steered his way to a date for prom. Your next piece of equipment is on MachineryPete.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on MachineryPete.com. of a trade truce with China was good news for soybeans on Monday, but wheat once again retreated. There's more from the CME. Today in the soybeans market, we rallied. The president uh, delayed those tariff increases with a tweet Sunday night, and it just shows that there's going to be some development in the trade resolution. But the rally was a little bit short-lived, even though we did get to a two-week high in the soybeans. The market's still up just a couple of cents right now. We're kind of waiting to see if anything else is going to happen. Wheat tumbled as well. The downward slide continues. A bit of a surprise, even though we had some positive news well, with the inspections. Uh, but it seems that that 9% drop in the last two weeks is just bringing in follow through selling. It seems that the wheat, the U.S. wheat, is really hasn't been competitive with European wheat. A lot of our uh, of our business has um, gone to France and what have you, and the market's very thin. And so um, we had a little bit of overflow selling. That's all from the floor at the CME Group here in Chicago. I'm Virginia McGathy. So what could a more permanent trade truce between the U.S. and China mean for the markets? Tyne Morgan has more in analysis. Here now with Doug Worling of Bauer Trading. Doug, so much focus on China, and that's been the, the you know kind of the case for nearly a year now. But no concrete deal in place right now. If we do see a concrete deal, if we do see both presidents kind of sign that line, what do you think the reaction is with, with the markets when kind of a lot of things are baked in right now? Well, you, you know, we, we've they've been relatively tame and boring because of this whole situation. You know, everybody wants closure. Uh, we have not been getting anything like that uh, other than supportive news, so to speak. So if you actually look at the price of uh, fall crops with carryouts and things, they're actually not that bad. You know, $4 for corn was around for a while. You had 950, 60 beans for a while. What I think you'll actually see happen if something would come to the forefront and finalize is you'll see a dramatic basis improvement because mm -hmm. historically uh, our basis for corn and soybeans are absolutely horrible uh, compared to what we've seen over you know, the last 15, 30 years around these time frames. Usually we get our best corn basis right now and we're 20 to 30 under instead of three over to eight under. Um, soybeans are pretty much in a similar boat and because we're not selling any soybeans to anybody, it's really affected our corn basis. So you, you may not get that big reaction in the market like uh, everybody is hoping for, mm -hmm. but you could and probably should see a good basis improvement. If we see that basis improvement, and let's say we do see better cash prices, considering how much old crop that we think farmers still have in storage, how much do you think they should sell with, with let's say, corn if we see a basis improvement? Well, so that, that's one of the reasons the markets may not do as much as most people think because there's going to be a lot of that that's going to be unloaded at a certain price level. So, you know, um, from, from a new crop standpoint at this point in time, you know, I, I hate to be saying this, but using the board from a hedge price or hedge to arrives at your elevator, if you're comfortable being locked in a delivery point, you can set your basis later. All right, Doug Willing, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Let's take a quick break right here on Ag Day, and then we have much more to come. For a free two-week trial to Jim's daily global market letter, call Bauer Trading toll-free at 1-800-533-8045. Ag Day, brought to you by Prosaro Fungicide from Bayer. back to Ag Day with meteorologist Cindy Clausen. Cindy, looking at this map, it looks like we'll receive some more precipitation in the west. Yeah, we really have some unsettled weather and that low pressure you're seeing over there is going to be a slow mover. So we're going to be seeing a lot more rain and that upper elevation snow. Let's take a look. 
We have a low pressure system again, as I mentioned, a slow mover. So as we head through the day, we're going to be seeing rain and upper elevation snow, and that really picks up as we get into tonight. We're also going to see kind of this upper level disturbance moving across the northern plains and into the upper Midwest and into parts of the Great Lakes as well. So unsettled weather along the Gulf Coast states will bring some showers and even some thunderstorms in spots there. Let's go through the overnight hours and you can see that low pressure system off the west coast getting even further inland. So we're going to see some heavy precipitation, but especially in the mountains. Snow encompasses much of the Great Lakes area and that will push on off to the east and through the day on Wednesday. Everything just pushes a little further to the east. We'll continue with that unsettled weather along the Gulf Coast states and into the southeast and more precipitation. Again, it's going to be heavy in spots in the west and especially those higher elevation areas with snow. Take a look at what we're expecting. Now this is the past 24 hours and you can see some of those higher elevations that have already had probably more than a foot of snow. But look at what happens as we add on the next 24 hours. We are really going to be seeing a good deal of snow and for the first half of the week we're looking at potentially four feet of snow in the Sierra Nevadas. We'll see that snow moving across the Great Lakes and intensifying just a little bit as we get into the northeast. So not quite as much as in the Intermountain West, but more snow for a lot of the Great Lakes. As far as precipitation itself, you can see how when you factor in how much of this is liquid, it's going to be quite a bit, especially in the northern half of California. Florida going to get a, especially the southern part of Florida, getting a, a pretty good dosing of some wet weather as well. Cold temperatures remain in the north central United States. It warms up into the 50s and 60s until you get down to Brownsville. We're looking at 80 degrees overnight hours. We are seeing some negative digits in parts of the Dakotas. Otherwise, uh, somewhat normal temperatures as you get further to the south, but we'll see that cold core remaining in the north central United States even as we get into tomorrow. Now let's look at the jet stream. We'll see fairly zonal flow across the area over the next few days. We'll watch that trough out in the west, but as we get into later this week and into the weekend, we have another trough bringing some very cold air to the north central and northeastern United States and some stormy weather. That's a look at your national forecast. Now let's check out the weather where you live. Blue water, New Mexico, plenty of sunshine for you today and a high of 53 degrees. Park River, North Dakota, mostly cloudy with some snow possible, a high of 3 degrees. And Beaver Creek, Ohio, partly cloudy, high of 38 degrees. A new kind of milk will soon be on the shelves for more American grocery stores. Plus one dairy producer forced to kill thousands of cows due to contaminated wells. Now hear what the government is doing next. Keeping track of the shifting market prices has never been so easy. Get the latest commodity prices sent directly to your cell phone with market updates. Just text MARKETS8 to 31313 to get started. We're continuing to keep watch on this. A New Mexico dairy farm forced to euthanize 4,000 cows after several wells became contaminated with PFAS. The chemicals entering the groundwater at a nearby Air Force base in Clovis, New Mexico. Now the Centers for Disease Control has announced it will study human exposure to the chemicals near eight other U.S. military installations. Take a look at this map. All of the communities selected for testing are near active or closed Air Force or Air National Guard installations. The chemicals are commonly used in fire retardant foam. They have been used since the 1950s. Officials say the goal of the study is to learn how the chemicals get into people's bodies. Art Scott owns the dairy farm we've been telling you about in New Mexico. He says he learned last summer that not only were his cows and calves impacted, but he also has eight to ten times the normal levels of PFAS in his bloodstream. The National Milk Producers Federation says any instance of PFAS in milk would be extremely isolated. A new kind of milk is getting space on the shelf at some grocery stores. The A2 Milk Company will now be distributing its milk to Kroger, Albertson and Safeway grocery stores. A2 Milk is marketed as an alternative to other milks containing the A1 beta casein protein. The milk only contains A2 protein. A2 claims their A1 beta casein free milk is easier for people to digest. Remember when you asked someone to prom? Well, bet you didn't do it exactly the way this student did. The story next in the country. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. This really raises
raises the stakes when it comes to the ultimate prom proposal. Take a look. Wyatt Burney is a student in Fort Benton, Montana. He used his 4-H show steer to help him ask fellow student Leah Fowles to the prom. He brought the steer called Beefcakes right to the school in order to ask her. He had permission, of course. He put a sign on Beefcakes saying, quote, if you don't go to prom with me, I'm gonna have a cow. Leah was obviously impressed by Wyatt's creativity, and she said yes. Well, that's all the time we have this morning. We're glad you tuned in. For all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Betsy Jibben. Have a great day.